Okay, we'll get started today. Um, we're going to move on to one of the last topics in Chapter 5, or maybe the last one, I don't remember if there's anything next week, but we're talking about what are, uh, limiting reactants today. But before we get to that, um, I do want to review a couple things we did last time since we ran out of time at the end. So remember last time we started talking about stoichiometry, which is the the process by which we can take an amount of one substance that's involved in a chemical reaction, either as a reactant or a product, and we can calculate an amount of another substance that's involved in that same reaction, either as a, another reactant or as a product. Um, so it allows, uh, and the key, the key concept being those mole ratios of reactants and products that we get from the balanced chemical reaction. So I had this problem in the notes last time, but didn't get a chance to go through it, so we'll start with it just to reorient ourselves on how we do these types of calculations. All right, so we have uh, this problem here. Iron metal reacts with water to form magnetite and hydrogen gas. How many grams of water are required to react completely with 25.0 grams of iron? So whenever you're given a stoichiometry problem, so this, um, I think I put these in the new notes, I hope. If, I hope some of you look confused. But if um, I, you either have them from the last notes or from this one. So this problem should be there. and, and um, we're giving you a, this is an obvious stoichiometry problem, so we're asking how much water reacts with iron or, or um, a certain amount of iron. The first thing you should always do is it, it certainly it behooves you to write a balanced chemical reaction. Um, so we can't even begin to start doing the problem, we can't even begin to start doing the calculations without a balanced reaction, so we have to start with that. There's, there's no shortcut around that. So we have to sometimes read the words in the problem and then produce a reaction from that. So that's, that's part of the battle here. So we have iron metal, which is just plain old Fe. It reacts with water, which we should hopefully know is H2O. And then that forms Fe3O4 and hydrogen gas H2. All right, so remember what's often helpful to do in when balancing a chemical reaction is pick the one that has the most atoms and set that to one. So that's going to be Fe3O4. We'll leave that as a coefficient of 1. So if we have three irons on the product side, we need three on the reactant side. If we have four oxygens on the product side in our Fe3O4, we also need four on the reactants. So that means we need four H2Os. And then finally, to finish balancing this off, we have eight hydrogens on the reactant side. So we need to also have eight on the product side. So the H2 also needs a coefficient of 4. Now. In all actuality, for this problem, we only care about iron and water, so as long as we have the correct coefficients on the left side of the equation, it doesn't really matter if we botch the right side. But we should know how to, to totally balance the a chemical equation, and this is going to be the, the balanced form with the lowest whole numbers. Now, the nice thing also is that for stoichiometry problems, if you, you know, if you left a fractional coefficient in there or if you didn't use the lowest whole number ratios, that's fine as long as it's still a correctly balanced reaction. So if for some reason we had decided to balance this as 6 irons plus 8 waters makes 2 Fe3O4 and 8 H2s, that's not the simplest form of the balanced reaction, but it will still work for the stoichiometry problem because it still gives us the same ratio of the species that's involved in the reaction. But this is what we have to start with. We can, um, we can check ourselves if we want to to make sure that the atoms match up on both sides. So on the reactant side, which is the left, for iron we have... 3 times 1 is 3. For hydrogen, we have 4 times 2. Each water has 2, so that's a total of 8. For oxygen, we have 4 waters, each with 1 oxygen, so a total of 4. We go to the product side. For iron, it's going to be 1 Fe3O4, so 1 times 3 is 3. For hydrogen, we have 4 hydrogens. 4 times 2 each is 8, so those match up. And then for water, for, sorry, for oxygen, we have four Fe3O4s. Sorry, we have one Fe3O4 with four oxygens. One times four is four. So all of them check out on the reaction product side. It's good to double check yourselves, especially if you have time, and especially when we're doing more complicated reactions that we'll get to next week. It's always helpful to check the atoms on each side and make sure they're balanced after the fact as well. Make sure you didn't mess up anywhere. Okay, so now that we have a balanced reaction, we can do the conversion. We're looking for how much water reacts with 25 grams of iron. All right, so we can't lose sight of our balanced reaction here.
All right, so we're looking for the grams of water that are reacting. So that's what a, sort of our endpoint is going to be, grams of water. And we're given an amount of iron, Fe. So we have 25 grams of, of Fe. When doing a stoichiometry problem, the first thing you should almost always do is convert to moles. So we're going to convert from grams to moles because to convert into another substance, we need mole ratios. So one mole of iron, we use its atomic mass. So remember that for, for pure elements, we can go to the periodic table and just read off the atomic mass. That's going to be the mass of one mole, which is 55.85 for iron. And we're going to divide by the atomic mass because we want grams to cancel and we want to end up in moles. Now we're in moles of iron, but we're interested in the amount of water that's required. So we're going to use the mole ratios for iron and water to convert between an amount for iron and an amount for water. So we use the, the coefficients from the chemical reaction. We want moles of iron to cancel out, and we want to convert into moles of H2O. So then the numbers that go into this ratio are just the coefficients in the chemical reaction. So iron has a 3 in front of it, so we put a 3 down here. Water has a 4 in front of it, so it's going to be 4 moles of water per 3 moles of iron. And then finally, the last step, we want to go into grams of water. So this is in moles right now, so we can use the molecular weight of water, the molar mass, which is given as 18.02. And again, do we multiply or divide? We want moles to cancel. We want to end up in grams of water. So we want the 18.02 to be in the numerator because molecular weights are always grams per mole. So it's 18.02 grams of water per one mole. So moles cancel out and we're now left with grams of water, which is what we wanted to get to. So when we multiply those few steps across, we get 10.8 grams of H2O. All right, so this is a typical mass to mass stoichiometry problem where we start with a mass of one reactant and we ask you to find the mass of the other reactant that would also participate in that reaction. All right, and the key, the key revolving point here is always going to be moles. You get to the moles of one reactant, you can use mole ratios then to find moles of the other reactant. So that concept is still going to be important today, but say we're going to introduce a topic called limiting reactants. So in this problem, I just gave you the amount of one reactant and said, you know, how much, of the, how much water do we need to react with that? But sometimes when you're doing a chemical reaction, you don't, if you, if you just put in two random amounts of a, of a reactant, then you know, how do we know how much product can actually form? So this is the concept of limiting reactant, where if you mix together two reactants and they're not exactly in the perfect ratio, one of those is going to limit how much product can form. Okay, so we can do this in sort of a culinary ex analogy. So if I were to try to make guacamole for the whole class, I would need a lot of ingredients. So on a normal, you know, at home scale, I use six avocados, three tomatoes, and two limes, plus a bunch of other things. Um, but let's say I wanted to make it for all of you guys, all four, 500 of you, or however many there are now. Um, and so I went to you know Fiesta or some similar store, and I, and I just cleaned out the shelves, and I got 28 avocados, 17 tomatoes, and 14 limes. The question is, how much guacamole could I make with that set of ingredients? All right. So if you if you have a you know and the same thing happens in chemical reactions. If you just dump a bunch of things into a chemical reaction without really caring about what ratio they're in, how much product can you make, which is going to be determined by, by one of the reactions that we call the limiting reactants. So if we think about this as a chemical equation, we know that the recipe is six avocados plus three tomatoes plus two limes yields two pounds of guacamole. So that's the ratio of everything that we need to make, to make this. And that's exactly what a chemical equation tells us as well. So let's say if we have 28 avocados, how many pounds of guacamole can we make? So that's the number of, of avocados that we got at the store. And we know from our recipe, from our balanced equation here, that we, have, we can make two pounds of guacamole for every six avocados. And so that means with 28 avocados, we could make 9.3 pounds of guacamole. All right, so we have enough avocados to make 9.3 pounds. If we do the same thing for the other ingredients that we have, we bought 17 tomatoes. We can make two pounds for every three tomatoes. And that means with these 17 tomatoes, we can make 11 pounds of guacamole. 
if we had enough of the other ingredients. And then with our 14 limes, it takes two limes to make two pounds. So that means with 14 limes, we could potentially make 14 pounds of guacamole. So this smallest number here, which is given by the avocados, that limits the amount of guacamole we can actually make. Because if we didn't, you know, so, so the, we could potentially make more if we had enough avocado, but we don't have enough avocado, so that's going to limit the amount that we can make. So in some cases, in a chemical reaction, one of the reactants is going to limit the amount of product that can form, and that's the analogy we're trying to draw here. All right, so that's kind of a culinary analogy for limiting reactant where one of the ingredients limits how much you can make. So we're going to have, at the end of this, we're going to have extra tomatoes and extra limes. We're going to use all of our avocado to make 9.3 pounds, and that's the most we can make unless we have more avocados available. Okay, so that's kind of a cooking analogy for it. If you, if you have ingredients to make something, if they're not in the right ratio, you're going to have one that limits how much you can actually make. So if we're doing stoichiometry problems, if we have the amounts of two reactants, we want to figure out, before we figure out how much product forms, we have to figure out which of those reactants limits the amount of product that can form. Um, so there's a couple ways to do this. Um, the way that your book does it is slightly longer, but it works. So it, it's kind of up to you guys what you're most comfortable with, but I'm going to do it a slightly different way than your book does it. But we want to figure out which reactant is the limiting reactant. So let's say we have two reactants, A and B, and we're combining them in some ratio. And we want to know which one of those is going to limit the amount of product that forms. The first thing we should do is determine the moles of each. Let's call them A and B. And then here's the way your book does it, which I think gets a little bit confusing, but maybe it'll, it'll resonate with, with some of you, so you're certainly welcome to use it. It's, it's valid, but I think it's a little bit confusing sometimes. We're going to determine how many moles of B are required to react with that much A. So we're going to use the balanced chemical reaction to say, if we have this many moles of A, how many moles of B are actually going to react with that? And then if the amount you calculate, and this is where I think it gets confusing because you have to remember this or, or rationalize this every time. Sorry, I should reward this a little bit. If the amount you calculate is less than the actual amount of B present, So you're going to take that amount that you calculate and compare it to the amount of B that you actually have. If the amount you calculate is less, that means you have excess B then that would mean A is limiting reactant. And then the exact opposite applies if the amount you calculate is more than the amount that's actually present. All right, so those of you that follow the textbook, you'll see that this is how they do it. I personally think it's a little bit extra work and a little bit more confusing than the way that I'm going to do it. So. Uh, I'll introduce it here, but I'm not going to use this in any of the problems that I do. The way that I'm going to teach you is the way that I was taught uh, many, many years ago, which is um, what's called the it's called a stoichiometric ratio. So for each reactant, we're going to determine a stoichiometric ratio. Um, I think I learned when did, when did I take general chemistry? I think 2003, 2004. So if you want to get an idea for how long ago it was, that's when it was. Um, so the the shorter way to do this, which is in some cases, not going to save you a ton of time, but it still, I think, is a little bit more clear than doing it the other way, is we're going to determine a parameter that we call stoichiometric ratio. All right. 
for each reactant. Alright, so for each reactant we're going to determine a stoichiometric ratio where this ratio, which I'll abbreviate R, is going to be the moles of that reactant. So we still have to calculate the moles of each reactant. And then we divide the moles by the reaction coefficient for that reactant. So that's the number in the chemical reaction that tells you how many moles are involved. So this ratio is what we call the stoichiometric ratio. So we're going to get a number for each reactant, a stoichiometric ratio for each reactant. And the reactant that has the smallest stoichiometric ratio is the limiting reactant. which I'll abbreviate LR, limiting reactant, okay? So you just calculate the R for, for both or three or however many reactants you have, and the one that's the smallest is the limiting reactant. And then the, the key point is that once we know what the limiting reactant is, any other calculation we do for the chemical reaction, whether it's the amount of product that's formed or the amount of the other reactant that actually reacts, all of those have to start with the limiting reactant. So any stoichiometric calculation you do has to start with the limiting reactant. Alright, so that's what you have to remember after you find limiting reactant. The other important point, which I'll make over and over again as I do example problems, is that this stoichiometric ratio is a fairly fast and a fairly straightforward way of determining what the limiting reactant is. But once you do that, once it serves its purpose and tells you what the limiting reactant is, this number is pretty much useless after that. So don't use it anymore, basically. Use it to help you find what the limiting reactant is, but then from then on or forward, you don't need to use that number anymore. So don't, don't try to use it for anything else besides just telling you what the limiting reactant is. Okay? So a frequently asked question that, that comes up when we're, when we're introducing this topic um, is, you know, how, how do I know if I need to determine a limiting reactant? Because we did a bunch of stoichiometry problems last time, we did another one today where, you know, this wasn't even an issue, so, why, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, how do I know when I have to worry about that? So the way that you know is, um, if you're given amounts of two or more of the reactants, if we tell you you have you know, this much A and this much B as part of the reaction, if we're giving you amounts of two or more, you must first determine which is a limiting reactant. So in all the problems that we did up until now, I only gave you the amount for one reactant, in which case you don't have to worry about limiting reactant because there's only one reactant where you know how much you have. But if you are given amounts of two or more, you have to determine which one's limiting first. And you have to do this. There's no, there's no way around it. All right. So that's how you know if the, if the if the problem gives you the grams or the moles or whatever, you know, any amount associated with two different reactants or more than two different reactants, you have to figure out which one is limiting first. And then any other situation, if you're only given amount for one reactant. Or if, we just, or if we're just starting with an amount of product, like how much of this reactant is necessary to form this much product, if, if that's the situation where we don't even tell you anything about the reactants, then you can just start the problem as normal. So you only have to worry about limiting reactant when amounts for two or more are given.
And please always remember that. Okay? So that's sort of the story here. And now let's just do a bunch of examples of this and see how this works. All right, so really there's only one additional step, which is to find limiting reactant. And then after that, it just becomes a stoichiometry problem. So let's say we have this problem here. We're taking ammonia gas, NH3, and reacting it with fluorine, F2, to make N2F4 and HF. And we want to know how many grams of N2F4, so that's one of our products, can be obtained if we take 5 grams of ammonia and react it with 15 grams of F2. So we're, we're taking two reactants, combining them with 5 grams of one, 15 grams of the other, how much of our product can form during this reaction. All right, so if we're given the amounts of two reactants, we're given the amounts of NH3 and the amount of F2, we have to determine the limiting reactant first. So remember, the process for doing this is to first determine the moles of each reactant. All right, so this is just a mass to moles calculation that we've been doing over and over again. So the moles of ammonia, we have 5.00 grams of NH3. And the molar mass of NH3 is given as 17.0. So we divide by the molar mass. And that gives us 0 0.294 moles of NH3. And then we do the same thing for the other reactant, which is F2. So we have the mass of F2, so we can find the moles of F2. It's 15 grams of F2. And that's a molar mass of 38 this time. Zero point three nine five moles of F2. Now remember that just having the number of moles doesn't tell us what the limiting reactant is. Another common mistake that people make is they calculate the moles of each one and they're like, oh, NH3 is smaller, that has to be the limiting reactant. Remember that just the number of moles of reactant doesn't tell you whether it's limiting or not. We have to find the stoichiometric ratio by dividing by the coefficient. So the next step, we have to determine the stoichiometric ratios. So the stoichiometric ratio for our first reactant, NH3, we take the moles of that reactant, so that's this number here, 0.294, and we divide it by the coefficient in the balanced chemical reaction. So this reaction that we're given is in fact balanced. It has a coefficient of 2 in front of NH3. So we take the moles, we divide it by 2, and that's our stoichiometric ratio for NH3, 0 0.147. A unitless quantity, and like I said, after we're done using it, a totally useful, useless quantity. And then for F2, the moles of F2 were 0 0.395. Its coefficient in the balanced reaction is a 5. There's 5 in front of F2. So when we divide 0 0.395 by 5, we get 0 0.0790. This number is clearly the smaller of the two, so that means F2 is the limiting reactant. All right, so whichever one has the smaller stoichiometric ratio is the limiting reactant, that's F2. So we do those steps to find out that F2 is a limiting reactant. And now from here we can proceed to solve the problem, which is how many grams of product N N2F4 can form. So the last step then to, to do this is just to do the calculation that we're asked about. But we always have to start with a limiting reactant. As part of the process for determining that F2 was a limiting reactant, we had to convert, we had to con calculate the moles of F2. So if we're looking for the grams of N2F4 that form, we can start with the moles of our limiting reactant. So up here we calculated that there are 0 0.395 moles of our limiting reactant, so we can use that as our starting point. We could also start with the mass of limiting reactant, but that's basically undoing one of the steps that we already did. So we have 0 0.395 moles of F2, 
And now we can convert into moles of product, N2F4, by using the stoichiometric ratios, the, the coefficients in the chemical reaction. So we want moles of F2 to cancel, and we convert into moles of N2F4. So the coefficient for F2 is 5, the coefficient for the product N2F4 is 1. So it's a 1 to 5 mole ratio. And then we're asking about the mass of N2F4 that's forming, what, how many grams of N2F4, so we have to multiply them by the molar mass, which is 104. So it's grams per mole. Moles cancel out, we're in grams, and that gives us 8.22 grams of N2F4. All right, so that's the maximum amount of product that we can form in this reaction, 8.22 grams. And that's determined by starting with the limiting reactant and calculating out then how much product can form. Okay, any questions on that? Okay. And then one other question we could ask you on these now is how many grams of excess reactant remain after the reaction? So if you have two reactants, F2 is the limiting reactant. The other one is what we call the excess reactant. That means we have more than that that, that we, and we actually need, so there's going to be some of that left over at the end. So NH3 is going to be our excess reactant. And that means after the chemical reaction is finished, after all of our product has formed, after all the F2 has reacted, there's still going to be some NH3 left over. So another property of limiting reactant is that during the reaction, all of the limiting reactant gets consumed, it converts, gets converted into product, but then whatever the other reactant or reactants are, those are the excess ones, and they're going to be some left at the end. So this question asks how much NH3 is left over at the end. So the first thing we're going to do is figure out how much NH3 was actually consumed during the reaction if all of our limiting reactant reacted with it. So when we calculate the grams of NH3, we're going to calculate the amount that's consumed first. And that's just another stoichiometric calculation. So we started with 0 0.395 moles of our limiting reactant F2, and we're asking how many moles or how, much, how many grams of NH3 are going to react with that many moles of F2. So using the same set of steps, we use stoichiometric ratios. We're going to convert into moles of NH3. So we use 2 moles of NH3 for every 5 moles of F2. That's, again, the ratio from the chemical reaction, 2 to 5. So moles of F2 cancel out, and then we convert into grams of NH3. Um, I think on the first slide I gave you the molar mass of NH3 is 17.0. So we use its molar mass to figure out how many grams of NH3 that corresponds to. And so what we get is 2.69 grams of NH3. Remember that this represents the amount that was consumed, the amount that ended up getting converted into our product N2F4. So that's the amount of NH3 that was consumed. So the amount that's left over, the excess amount, is just the starting amount minus this amount. So the grams of NH3 that are in excess, which is the final answer we're asked to report here, we started with 5 grams of NH3. That's what we gave you in the first part of the problem, how much we're starting with. So that's our starting amount. We're consuming, we're losing 2.69 grams during the course of the reaction. That's how much is consumed. And so that means we're left with 2.31 grams of NH3. All right, so out of our five grams of NH3 that we started with, 2.69 reacted, 2.31 were left over at the end, and, and there's no more F2 left for them to, to react with. Okay, so the limiting reactant will completely get consumed during your chemical reaction. There'll be none of that left at the end, but the excess reactant will have some amount left over, which you can calculate by first figuring out how much actually reacts, and then subtracting it from the amount that you started with. Okay. All right, I'm going to let you guys try one. So this is just for fun. This is not a quiz. But I figured I'd break the monotony a little bit and let you guys do one in, in your clickers. So let's pull that up and just see how you guys do. Um, we're only going to do this second problem here. Um, 
All right, I'll go ahead and pull this up. I think I have to... This is our start session. And then all right, so we're, we're doing how many of this is theoretically attain, obtained? That's probably not enough time. I'll give you more than that. I'll give you three minutes or so to see how many responses come in. So again, this is just for practice, just to see how we do with this new concept. So we have another reaction here. Oh, come on. I forgot part of the problem, so. All right, hang on a second. All right, I botched this. Um, all right, I, I have it here. Sorry, give, give me a second to correct my silly mistake. So we have... So we have 5.25 grams of N2O, 4.05 grams of sodium, and... 2.57 grams of NH3 are the reactants that we're combining. It's amazing that 23 of you already got the answer when you didn't have the, the information you needed. Um, so this one is, and then the molar masses are going to be in parentheses here. 44.01, 22.99, which is just its atomic mass, and then the one we just saw, 17.03. Okay, so that's the amount of each reactant we're combining. That's their molar masses. We want to know how many grams of NaN3 sodium azide are theoretically obtained. Okay, so see how we do with that. Sorry for leaving part of the question out. I had this as a two part question before, and then I omitted the first part by accident. Let's go through it. So we, we see the answer is D and 46% of you got it. So these problems are involved, okay? So we have to you know, become efficient at doing them because obviously in an exam situation you have roughly you know, three to four minutes per question. So we have to go through the steps in a pretty ordered and efficient way. So we, we're given this chemical reaction um, and I gave you the amounts of each that we're using. So. 5.25 grams of N2O, 4.05 grams of sodium, since I forgot to put it in this version of the notes, and 2.57 grams of NH3. So we're combining all three of the reactants in those amounts, and we want to know how much of our product, NaN3, is theoretically obtained. So theoretically obtained means the maximum amount of product that can form. That's just what you calculate out when you do stoichiometry, is the maximum product that can form. So the first thing we have to do is figure out the limiting reactant. So we start by calculating the moles of each reactant. So for each of the three reactants, we have a mass amount. We're going to convert that into moles. And this should by now be a very familiar calculation. So we have 5.25 grams of N2O. 
the molar mass of N2O is, uh, well, given is 44.01, at least in my version is 44.01. Sorry, you don't have that. Uh, so that's the molar mass of N2O. So we have 0.119 moles of N2O. We calculate its stoichiometric ratio by taking that amount, 0.119, and dividing it by the coefficient in the chemical reaction, which is a 3. There's a 3 in front of N2O. So that's about 0 0.040. So the stoichiometric ratio for N2O is 0 0.040. And remember, we're going to calculate that for the other two reactants to compare them to find out which one is limiting. So now we do it for sodium. 4.05 grams. The atomic mass of sodium, which you can get off the periodic table, is 22.99. So we have 0 0.176 moles of sodium. And the stoichiometric ratio for sodium, R, is going to be 0 0.176 divided by the coefficient. So for sodium, that's a 4. So this comes out to 0 0.04. Four, so only slightly bigger than the first one, but that means that sodium cannot be the limiting reactant. The stoichiometric ratio is slightly larger than the first one. And then we go and do the third reactant, so NH3. You have 2.57 grams. The molar mass is 17 for NH3. Or 17.03 for being really precise. And then its stoichiometric ratio is that number divided by the coefficient. The coefficient for NH3 is just a 1. There's nothing in front of NH3, so it's a coefficient of 1. So that means its stoichiometric ratio is 151, which is much higher than the rest. So the one of these that's the absolute smallest, which is N2O, is going to be our limiting reactant. All right. So we've identified N2O as a limiting reactant. And now when we, when we want to calculate the amount of our product that forms, NaN3, we have to use this as our starting point, this molar amount, 0.119. So I have to add a page here. Give me a second. All right, so now we're ready to do the calculation. We know what our limiting reactant is, so we can start doing the conversions that we need to figure out how much product is formed, NaN3. So we're going to start our calculation with N2O because that's the limiting reactant. And so if we're looking for the mass of NaN3, the grams of NaN3, we know that we have 0 0.119 moles of our limiting reactant. That was the first thing we calculated up here is moles of each reactant. So we have 0.119 moles of our limiting reactant, which is N2O. We use stoichiometric ratios to convert into moles of the product that we're interested in. So if we go to the balanced chemical reaction, we have one mole of NaN3 for every three moles of N2O. It's a one to three ratio, coefficient of one, coefficient of three. So one mole of product, NaN3, for every three moles of our limiting reactant that are consumed. And then the molar mass for NaN3, which I think I failed to give you also, is 65.01. You can calculate that yourself. It's just sodium and three nitrogens, and that's per mole. And so, assuming I didn't make any math mistakes, that should work out to 2.58 grams. All right, so hopefully 46% of you had those steps roughly correct and not just were totally lucky. Um, and that's the steps that you want to take then to get 2.58 grams as the amount of product that can be theoretically obtained. All right, so the rest of you just keep practicing these and make sure always that you first find the limiting reactant and then from there, the stoichiometry calculations are the same. Now the last concept I want to introduce to close out today is what's called percent yield. Okay, so, so we've talked now how to do all these stoichiometric calculations and, and as we just saw, that amount of product that we calculated was the theoretical amount of NaN3 that could form. It's the maximum amount that could form if everything went perfectly. So that's what we call the theoretical yield. And that's the amount that we're going to be calculating whenever we do a stoichiometric calculation. 
So the theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that can form And that's when all of the limiting reactant is consumed. All right, so that's what we would calculate then when we're doing the stoic geometry calculation. If we calculate how much product can form, that's what we call the theoretical yield. That's the amount you get if everything goes perfectly. But sometimes, you know, life is not always perfect, um, and we get an amount of product that's less than that. So that's what we call the actual yield, the amount of product that is obtained experimentally. So if we go into the lab and do the chemical reaction and measure how much product do we get, you know, this is the amount that we call the actual yield. And keep in mind, this is a measured quantity, so there's not really a way to calculate actual yield unless we gave you, you know, percent yield as we'll, as we'll define in a second. But in general, we can't calculate this. This is an experimental quantity. This is, if you guys have done a chemical reaction in your chem lab, you go to the lab, you do the reaction, you measure out or weigh out the amount of product that you make, and the amount that you record in your notebook is the actual yield for that reaction. And there's a few reasons why, in almost every case, the actual yield is going to be less than the theoretical yield. So one is what you guys like to call human error in your lab reports, but is really better described as experimental losses. So sometimes when you're doing your action, let's say, well, if, if one of your products is a gas and you're trying to collect the gas, maybe some of it escapes into the atmosphere, or maybe you know some of it sticks to the you know to the spatula that you're using to weigh it out, or some of it get spilled. These are all what we call experimental losses, things that just happen when you're doing a chemical reaction that prevent you from getting 100% of your product. Um, another possibility is what we call side reactions. So these are basically the reasons why the experimental actual yield is not often equal to the theoretical. So side reactions is where two or more of the reactants that are participating in the reactant can also react in some other way. So you can get a whole, you know, it's basically two reactions happening at once. So not all of your limiting reactant is then going to be consumed, con converted into your desired product. It's going to be converted into something else. So a side reaction is a second reaction that can happen under the same conditions. Um, you'll learn a lot about side reactions if you take organic chemistry. And then finally, something else that you'll talk in more detail about in chemistry too is some reactions just don't go to completion. In other words, the best you can do is that only some of your limiting reactant reacts to form the product, but there's always going to even be some limiting reactant left over that just doesn't convert all the way to the product. And that's what we call an equilibrium or an incomplete reaction, which we're not going to deal with in this course, but you guys will talk about a lot if you take chemistry too. So those are the three reasons, but the bottom line is that the actual yield is, in almost every case, going to be less than the theoretical yield. It's never greater than the theoretical yield. And so then from that, we can calculate a percent yield, which is just the ratio actual yield divided by theoretical times 100. So it's a percent, so we have to multiply that ratio by 100. And you should always get a number that's less than or equal to 100. If you calculate a percent yield that's greater than 100, it means you messed up, I guarantee it. All right, it's just not physically possible. Um, so your, your, your percent yield is going to be something less than 100. So let's just do one quick example of calculating percent yield. So we have WCl6, which we can prepare by reacting tungsten W with chlorine Cl2. We combine 5 grams of tungsten, 6.75 grams of chlorine, and the yield, the obtained yield is 5.92 grams. What is the percent yield for this reaction? So this amount here, this amount of WCl6 that we formed is the actual yield, 5.92 grams. So the reaction here is tungsten plus chlorine to make WCl6. This is a pretty easy one to balance. We just throw a three in front of chlorine and we're done. Okay, so that's a very easy one to balance. We need a balanced reaction to start. We have to calculate limiting reactants, so we start with those set of steps. Because we're giving you amount of tungsten, five grams, and an amount of chlorine, 6.75. So we calculate the moles of each. We have five grams of tungsten W. 
And I should have given you molar masses here again, but the molar mass of tungsten from the periodic table was 183.84. So we have 0 0.0272 moles of tungsten, and then its stoichiometric ratio is just going to be that same number because the coefficient for tungsten is 1. So this number divided by the coefficient is the same number. And then for Cl2, we have 6.75 grams of Cl2. The molar mass of Cl2 is twice the atomic mass. So we divide by that number, which is 70.9. We have 0 0.0952 moles. And then the stoichiometric ratio for Cl2 is 0 0.0952 divided by its coefficient, which is a three. There's a three in front of Cl2. And so we get 0 0.0317. This number is smaller, so this is our limiting reactant. Okay, so that's the first step is determining limiting reactant. And now if we want to know percent yield, we have to calculate the theoretical yield. So that's the maximum amount of WCl6 that can form when all of our limiting reactant is converted into that product. So if we quickly go through that step, we're running low on time again, but I'll try to get through this. So we have this reaction here. And we're looking for the mass of WCl6 that can theoretically be obtained. We have 0 0.272 moles of our limiting reactant. That's what we calculated in the last slide. The molar ratio from the chemical reaction is 1 to 1. One mole of product forms for every one mole of tungsten that reacts. So it's just multiplying by 1. And then finally, the molar mass of WCl6, which I guess I gave you on this page, 396.54. We multiply by that to get the mass of WCl6 that can be formed. So what we calculate out is 10.8 grams. And that represents our theoretical yield. So that's the maximum amount of WCl6 that would form if all of our limiting reactant were completely converted into this product. Okay, so that's our maximum theoretical yield. And then finally, for percent yield, we just have to divide the two. Actual yield divided by theoretical times 100. So if we're asking you to calculate percent yield, we're going to give you the actual yield. So this 5.92 grams here, which is the amount that we obtained from this reaction, that's the actual yield, 5.92. The theoretical yield was 10.8. That's what we just calculated previously. We multiply that, whole, that ratio by 100, and we get 54.8%. All right, so that's how we do percent yield problems. There's just one additional step. Calculate the theoretical yield and then divide the two to get percent. All right, I'll see you guys on Monday.